How many of you have Wi-Fi enabled on your phone? Take a look. Take a look and put your hand up, please. Yep. How many of you have Bluetooth enabled on your phone? Okay. We've been scanning the entire morning, and we found 42 vulnerable phones in this room. And we found one phone. It's Ricardo's iPhone. And I'm not going to show you the crazy sheep porn, because I don't want to freak you out. <laughs> but let me show you something else Ricardo was looking at. Whenever the next slide is there. So Ricardo was checking out the program. I know this is going to take balls, but where's Ricardo? Who's Ricardo? Oh, Ricardo. Hi. So, Ricardo, have you updated your phone in the last three days to overcome the WPA2 attack? You have not. Okay. Ricardo, can you just take a look at your screen? Can we take a look at a screen? There we go. Oh, it went to screen server. <laughs> Here's the deal. How often do you guys update your phone when there are updates available? I want to see one show of hands. Who updates their phone every time there's an update available? Okay, there's a lot of, who doesn't do it? Yeah, okay. I count roughly 42 hands. So here's the deal. The point is, society needs to wake up and smell the coffee. Cybersecurity is part of our daily lives. We need to practice cybersecurity each and every day if we want to be safe. We live in a connected world. In fact, it's just going to get more connected. You've got speaker on speaker talking to you today about how connected we all are. And you know what we're going to do? We're not just going to connect you to each other. We're going to connect all the things to each other. So our future looks like this. Our future looks like we take all the dumb things we have now, yeah, and then we make them smart by connecting them to each other. Okay, I want to ask you like a real life question. How many times have you encountered it happening that you've got two dumb people, you seat them together at a party, and suddenly they win the Nobel Prize? How likely is it to happen in our virtual world that we take two dumb devices, we let them talk to each other, and suddenly they're smart? For me, everything that's smart has an inherent vulnerability. And when you look at the Oxford definition of IoT, it actually will tell you that the only way that it will crumble is because of a failure in security. I want to talk about one case in point. Does anybody have one of these vacuum robots at home? Oh, yeah, you do. Who has this particular one from LG? Yeah, you do, right? You got to get that updated. A couple of days ago, actually three days ago, um, what was announced is that this robot will turn your smart home into a spy home. Because what the hacker can do is turn on the camera that's used to activate this robot, you know, that makes the map when it's kind of vacuuming your home, and it'll use it to spy on you. You going to get that updated? Yeah, right? Yeah. So. You know, it's one thing when I'm, when I'm telling you about your smartphone. It's another thing when I'm talking to you about your connected vacuum cleaner. But folks, we need to really wake up because I need to tell you it is beyond irritating when all of these, you know, so-called smart devices collude, work together, and then stage a distributed denial of service attack. This happened last year. It actually brought down one of the most critical infrastructure pieces we all know. Can you guess what it was? That's right, Netflix. Netflix brought crumbling down to its knees. So, you know, uh, growth of global population resulted in the uh, failure of Netflix. And what it really means is that we need to start paying attention because this is going to bring down other pieces of infrastructure. This is a real map. This is not fake. You can Google this now. It's called the digital attack map. It's brought to you by all the people that are like working to defend against DDoSs across the world. And this is live traffic from just a few days ago. This is this year. Okay, this is the global distributed denial of traffic. And as it's getting you know, more and more and more, the cost of executing such an attack is getting less. In fact, how many of you work in companies? How many of you have competitors? Keep those hands up. All right, 
In order to knock out your competitors, it'll cost you roughly about 150 US dollars. Kill your competitor for a week. Sounds pretty good, right? And it's not a joke. And you know, when we open the newspapers today, it's every day, it's a new data breach. So we saw that the entire government of Sweden was compromised this last summer. The entire record of everyone who had a driver's license or an aviation license, all of their data was breached. They actually even mailed the database out and there was separate marketing action. We saw Equifax. I'm not even gonna talk to you about that because I expect you to know that one. The clue is that these data breaches aren't there like when you have a credit card number breach. Because when a credit card gets breached, what do you do? You call the credit card company, you have them block the card, you maybe get a new card, and then you're fixed, right? Right. What happens when your BASN, your passport number, your uh, driver's license number, when all of the information, every place you've ever lived, you know, when it comes to Equifax, every kind of credit insurance you've ever had, when all of this information is compromised, it's not about monitoring or changing one credit card. This kind of data breach will follow you around for the rest of your life. We need to wake up. When we talked about the hack that I told you I did, which I didn't, Ricardo is working with me on this one. I didn't hack you because it would be illegal for the CISO of KPN to hack a group in the doula. But if I were to hack you, I could, because it's actually based on a real attack. And it's actually based on a real update that iPhone really issued, that you really did not go and gather. And I'm sure that you also didn't go and get the same update that's available for Android telephones. So everything I did is for reals. I just needed to not really hack you today. But it's all possible. There's another attack that's operating over Bluetooth called Blueborn. It's both of these attacks are terrifying because they're operating at the most basic level of the protocol that's enabling the communication. When this goes wrong, everything gets affected and everything that's connected becomes more vulnerable. And you can say, you know what, it's my phone, it's fine. But what happens when it's your pacemaker? Also not a joke, this summer, St. Jude Medical had issued an announcement that they had 500,000 pacemakers that were already in humans that were vulnerable and needed a, a software upgrade. But it was a voluntary recall, which means like I accidentally put it something incredibly vulnerable, like a scalpel in your body, but it's up to you if you want me to get that removed. So when we have medical manufacturers not taking cybersecurity seriously. When we have, by the way, this is also true, uh, less than two weeks ago, you saw a, an espate, you saw plastic surgery clinics being hacked, and what they do is they take all the data and they threaten to publish the information on the clients, including members of the royal family, if they don't get paid to a Bitcoin address. So this is a very vulnerable spot of our civilization. If we want to talk true vulnerability, though, what happens when we talk about vulnerable military equipment with a nuclear payload? This is not a fake image. This is an image of an F-16 flying above Rotterdam. This is not a fake image. What happens when we hack it? When it turns into an unmanned aircraft and you can control it remotely, but it has a missile payload then we're talking a new, about a new way to think about cybersecurity. Then it's not just about me getting Ricardo's iPhone. The reason that I'm worried is because for the last maybe 15 years, we've paid more attention to war games. Our prioritization has been screwed up because we've been worried about how to get to our enemies by making them vulnerable instead of worrying about something called information assurance, which is how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our critical infrastructure? And because of this screwed up prioritization thing, this is why we're in the problems we're in now. And you know, when you take a look at just how bad it is, it's really bad. This is a picture from the Snowden document where it tells you that governments, and specifically intelligence agencies, have cooperated with hardware vendors, software manufacturers, service providers, to basically have ubiquitous surveillance capability across the chipset, across the hardware, across the telecommunications providers. And these companies, they have no choice. If they don't work with the intelligence agencies, they will lose their license to operate. Take a look at the legislation that's happening in our very country. 
the referendums that are happening now. How involved are you in this public debate? And how much do you take it home with you? Do you actually give a damn? Is cybersecurity a part of your everyday life when it comes to how society is being determined? For us, it is. At KPN, we realized that our innocence was lost when we saw the example of Belgicum in Belgium that was hacked through a corporation of the NSA working together with the GCHQ. They used an incredibly expensive piece of malware called Regin, which used a very expensive thing called Zero Days. It actually used four Zero Days, and a Zero Days is a vulnerability that even the vendor, the manufacturer of the device or thing, knows about for Zero Days. So they don't know, and this vulnerability is out there in the wild attacking. And these zero days are made by anyone who will pay for them. So you have a group of digital mercenaries that will make you a zero day if you pay them enough. And what we see is that these kind of mercenaries, this is the hacking team, this is the equation group, they will work for whoever. But this one in particular worked for the NSA. And they built the NSA a zero day. You may have heard of this zero day because it was called WannaCry. And this zero day affected companies. It cost them hundreds of millions of dollars and actually completely debilitated their infrastructure. The example here is the APM terminals. You know, the Rotterdam Haven, Yeah, Maersk? OK. The difficulty thing here is, is that we don't know who actually did it, who actually released it, who actually brought it out. We have another group calling themselves the Shadow Brokers, but there's no big screen that says, ooh, hacking detected, like you see in the movies. So it's a lot of legwork from forensicators to try to figure out, was it this guy, was it, you know, this, what do we call him again? Um, Rocket Man? You know, was it the Chinese or was it the Israelis? It's probably all of them working together. Because when you look at the real story, what supposedly happened, follow me for a moment, apparently this guy over here working at the NSA took his work home using a, a laptop that he shouldn't have out of work with no real good security software. The Russians hacked a group called Kaspersky that was providing him the antivirus, but the Israelis were actually hacking the Russians who hacked the Americans. <laughs> You're still with me? And there's somewhere in here, probably the French are involved too, although I'm not sure of that. So, you know, it's a very complex world, and this world is getting more complex by the fact that we should realize at some point in time that surveillance and these kinds of counter-surveillance techniques are not just employed on big countries, but are on the backs of all of us. So when you take a look at it, there are actual, like, satellites that are launched. Uh, this is the National Reconnaissance Office. They actually, they, they also do fashion wear. So they issue a patch every time they launch a new reconnaissance satellite, and with catchy phrases like, nothing is beyond our reach. And they spy on global telecommunications. Yours, not just the you know, bad guys or the Israelis or the Chinese or whatever. Your communication is currently at risk. And they actually store it all, too. They have a gigantic data center in Utah where they keep all this communication. And the goal, the, the X prize, if you will, of this community is to launch a quantum computer that can not just get to that global communications traffic that's in the open, but also that encrypted traffic that's meant to be closed. And when they have that quantum computer, they will use it to unlock everyone's secrets. Not that the communication that's happening now, but everything that was ever stored as well. So all of the things that you've ever sent, plus that you're ever going to send, is at risk with a quantum computer. So what does China do? Well, they built a 2,000 long kilometer network and they launched their own satellite to have a fully encrypted link so that even when there is a quantum computer, that their data will be safe. What's the Dutch quantum computing strategy? What's yours when it comes to your company? What I want to tell you is very simple. We can actually solve this problem. We can take control of our cybersecurity future, even though we can't maybe determine what happened in our past. So the potential here is huge, because you can do updates. You can choose which hardware and software you use. You can like, really determine how you upgrade, uh, you know, how you do two-factor authentication. You can do all of those things. But fundamentally, you can do one thing which will change the entire game you can push the envelope back. You can give it back to the hardware and software vendors that should not just take up the responsibility, but get the liability for delivering us safe and secure products. 
It should be their responsibility, theirs, theirs alone, to make sure that every hardware, software, platform, or service that you all use is enabled at default by design and all through its life cycle until we're done with it. The deal is, I want us to enjoy our connected future. I want you to be able to talk to each other and to, you know, turn on your home robot so that the cat hair can be vacuumed when you're not at home. I want you to be able to do that, but I want you to also do that without fear, without worrying about, is that thing spying on you? Or looking at your children playing? Or, you know, is it doing things that it was never meant to do? So I need you to enjoy technology and safety and security and give it the place that it deserves, which is part of your everyday life. Thank you.